What happened was that my opponent played the VM, Vienna Gambit. Uh, he tried to surprise my thing. It usually was not what he plays. Uh, I think he plays Italian, but he came with this. Uh, a year ago, I lost really painfully again against the same opening. I was totally unprepared when I played that game. So I had to check the line on deep. And this time I did a much better job. I think actually, even if he tried to surprise me, the surprise uh, one was him. Now, Queen F3, just some comments about the game, the opening. We will pro I promise you we'll focus mostly on chess calculation, but there are some, some few ideas that I guess could be useful for some of you to know. So I will mention them quite fast. So Queen F3 is, is not the most typical move in an opening. It's not the move that you will look to play in the opening. But actually, Black cannot do much about it. He cannot exploit the queen bang on f3. And the idea is to force this knight to be trade for the knight on f3, on c3. If that happens, then white will have, even if yes, a really bad pawn structure, a really easy development, and a lot of pressure on the king side. So this is basically opening theory. I knew that. Uh, I checked the line a few months ago, as so I told you, and I know f5 is the best move here to keep the knight on e4 and, and hopefully force white to make more concessions to remove the knight from there. Now, this move is not a free move in the sense that I am giving something to white. The e5 pawn is now the passer and it's going to be something to consider for the rest of the game, as you will see. Now, in the opening and the middle game, this count pound is not of a concern, usually. There are many pieces that can be, that can help to keep it under control, but as we trade pieces, passers like these are really important. So it's something for me to keep an eye on. Yes, white could take uh, the pound, but in this case, the queen actually will be in a, a position where I could exploit it. I could develop my bishop, quite easily to c5 or b4, and I will castle. And also my bishop will come to g4. So why will rather keep that passer and not to help me take him? And still the knight on e4 is a problem. So he has to play d3. Knight takes, pawn takes. The next moves has been played many times. This is theory. I don't want to bore you explaining all the details, I will just tell you, yes, this has been done a lot. Like D4 is the one move that I could mention why. We don't want white to consolidate playing D4, and then this protected passer will be really strong, long term at least, so D4. Why don't want to take, because this will be a double threat, if I will take with the queen. So white tries to accelerate his development this way. Here, here. There is a threat with bishop h5 that will be painful. If I play, if we could play bishop h5 now, and I play g6, he would sacrifice the bishop. And actually, sadly, it happened to me once. As I told you, I have an embarrassing defeat. It was a rapid game, but still. Here, white is totally winning. I lost the game in like 20 moves. So, yeah, to take that pawn is not a good idea. Bishop e6. Uh, prevents that idea. If now bishop h5, g6, takes, takes, queen takes, and I could run away with my king, and here I will be totally safe. Two pounds for the piece is not enough here, and white does not have the development. So, yeah, that is not a great plan. For white, white, here, play c4. I play queen d7, again, Moves that are known, I've been trying to castle long. And knight h3 came. And usually it's not what white does here. Usually what white plays here is bishop f3 to put the knight on e2. So here I decided, you know what? I will play bishop before. I could have done it the previous move. White will have to lose now his castle right. <clears throat> and of course, that is usually awesome. Why I did not do it in the last move? Well, because in this line, uh, 
what black wants to do is to cast long and white actually does not want to cast in short. Why? Because the black pounds on the king side are really mobile. So it will be scary for white. The white king actually feels safer in the center with the locate that we have around here. Now, why then I, I gave the check? Well, because in this case, I thought, you know what? Now his knight cannot come to bother my bishop and my bishop will be really happy, a really happy camper on c3. So yeah, that happened. In d1, bishop d2 is also possible. Uh, and just in case, if you think, oh, this is a stupid for white, Richard Rapport played it in Tata Steel, uh, this, one of the strongest tournaments ever. Uh, like a day after I played this game, actually. So that was fun to see that happening. He lost his wife. So, uh, yeah, I don't think this is the most ambitious line for a white player in a top grandmaster level. But probably the opening didn't have to do much with it. It was a really complex game. And this one actually will be one too, as you will see. So, check, move there, castle. <coughs> Okay, rook b1, bishop c3, bishop f3. Okay, everyone, this is the point where we start talking about chess calculation. Now, listen, if you ask me, did you use chess calculation up to this point? I will tell you I badly did it, okay? Once he played knight h3, I use it a little bit. I use check. Because up to this point, everything was open in theory. And usually, if you know the moves that you play, either those are five moves or 20, yes, you want to check that you are doing the right thing, but you won't like, try to calculate a lot. You don't want to spend your time doing that. You want to be smart with your time. Okay? So, here... Sorry, I think my puppies are probably working too much. Okay, hopefully not. So, sorry about that. So, you don't use chess calculation if it's not necessary because you know the opening moves. You don't use it in the, but you try to make sure that you are paying attention always to what the guy wants to do. Look what happened here. He played knight h3, and then I realized, so oh, this is not a normal way to continue for him. So, I I thought, well, I will play bishop before. That should uh, make things a little bit different, different than what I have planned. So I will check that there is nothing crazy happening here. Okay, so once I was clear that no, it's okay. He played king d1. I played until we got to a position similar to what I knew in advance. Now here, here, I have to decide what to do. More or less what I expect to happen in the opening, finish at this point. So this is what I will call a critical position, not in the sense that something amazing is happening, but that I have to make my plan. And in chess, and I want you to realize this, it's always important not to try to look for one really good, great move. You should, in this strategy game, always aim to have a plan. I understand that sometimes because of the time constraints that we have, that is not that easy. Like we have to make a decision, the clock is ticking, what is the best move here? But for the most part, whenever we have the chance, we always should be thinking in terms of my plan is this one. This is what I want to achieve. This is my goal, not just the one move. And with chess calculation, this is important because when we're looking for moves, we should try to have an aim, an objective that we, we are looking to execute. If you're just trying to randomly look for moves in your head, that will be really difficult to do. You don't know what you are looking for. You are, don't know what you are trying to achieve. But if you have a goal, even if that goal is not the right one, once you start calculating, you will have a map that will show you, you know what, this is not exactly what I wanted. Oh, it seems like the position is going more into this direction. That is a better way to do it. And here, 
you look at this position and you may ask, do I really 